The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. Getting involved in plein air, which is like where we wanted to go, was... Yeah. was was he seen. knew exactly where I wanted to go. Did you see that? <laughs> Segway alert. I didn't I didn't even write it down or anything. He was like, let me talk about how I got into plein air. And I was like, that's right, because this is the plein air East End podcast. And we do like to talk about plein air here. You're right. Good, good work. Good work, Stuart. <laughs> so when well, you, you know, the cue cards help a lot. <laughs> uh, when you got into plein air? Uh, when you, is that when, when you became an yeah, artist? Yeah, it was kind of a... Um, can I get off your lap now? <laughs> Ew, that was really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I love radio. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Plan Air Easton Podcast. My name is Tim Wagon, and I'm here with... Hi, I'm Jess Bellis. Jess, this is our second week back. Um, feels kind of cool. It is very cool. Um, today, we talked to Stuart White, our grand prize winning, 13 years in Plan Air Easton, good friend, Easton resident. But here's my question, Tim. You ask him. You asked him like who he was. Did he answer that question? No. Um, I asked him about like what really makes a plein air painting a plein air painting. Did he really answer that question? No. Um, does he have any idea what's going on at Plein Air Easton this year, or did no. he offer any real advice? No, he didn't. <laughs> Why would anybody listen to this podcast? Well, because <laughs> Amy Stewart's going to be a politician. <laughs> That's not a good answer. Why would anybody listen to this podcast? Oh, I, I love his philosophy on stuff. I love listening to it. He's got a, he's got a smooth voice, too. No, uh, it, it is. it was a cool conversation. I feel like we really got a sense of what's going on in his head. He's a, he's a smart guy, and this is sort of a thinker of a conversation. Here so we go. We are here today with Stuart Burgess White. Stuart, welcome to the Plenary Houston Podcast. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Stuart, you um, are an artist. Yes. True or false? Yes, true. True. How the heck did that happen to you? You started drawing and painting when you were tiny. You came out of the womb with a paintbrush. Like, what happened? Well, I think it was a lot of that. I think it's... A lot of being birthed with paintbrushes. <laughs> no, it's basically well. getting uh, kudos when you're young. Whether it's honest or not, you t- it goes to your head, and you think you really are uh, pretty good. And it it's um, I, th- I think you just make it up from then on out. I remember one time uh, I went to school at Berkeley, and I was in People's Park, and I Did was. Did you grow up in California? No, but I I, I went you there. You found your way there. I found my way there. Okay, uh, I was chasing a girl, and uh, I was painting, uh, sketching. Some people in the park. It's kind of a. It was a homeless park then, as it is now. And some guy, I don't know he he looked like Gandalf the Wizard, and he came up and said, uh, "What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm I'm an artist." And he looks and he goes, "Are you sure?" <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So ever since then, I have to keep asking myself That's that, that like, question. You have what a little Gandalf that? on your shoulder. <laughs> Are you sure you're an artist? And that begs the question, well, who's an artist? What's an artist? You know, it's uh, a two-year-old is an artist. They come up with something. It's all there. We, we're constantly creating. Was there a specific artistic training that happened at Berkeley? Did you take art lessons the whole way through? I mean, like you're saying that you found yourself sitting there with a sketchbook that has never happened to me in my entire life. So well, like, I, sus- <laughs> I suspect that like something happened that, and you got a lot of encouragement. I hear that part, but was there training involved too? Were you always signing up for art classes? Like, Oh yeah. And, I mean, and just, if I could add to that too, I remember the good Drawers, the people who could draw in my class in grade school. There were two of them. You know what I mean? Keith Davis is out. If you're out there, Renee Buckler. They were the two <laughs> people who names. could draw. I remember everybody in the class knew that they were like the best ones. You know, is that is that your situation? Yeah, you remember those uh, weirdos? They're like 
crazy cartoon characters that were in hot rods and things like that. Sure. Do you remember those? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I got to copy in those, and then I was just like, instead of paying attention to the classes, I was just filling notebooks full of weirdos and then passing them out. And then sometimes you'd trade them, and I realized, oh, there's a business in this. Yes. <laughs> but I, I did, after a while, just... I love to draw, just loving to draw. And there's been relatives, neighbors, friends who've uh, encouraged me along the way. Uh, I grew up in Europe. So I'd just be transfixed by the paintings and the sculpture and the drawings. And uh, you know, it just gave me a, a real great desire to be a part of that world. And the, you know, the practicalities of it is it's, it's, it's difficult, it's hard work. Uh, and I did other things instead, you know, to, to make a living. But so I tried to work it in all Berkeley, the time. At Berkeley, did you study art? Studied art history and, uh, and yeah, fine arts, painting, printmaking. What rooms and, would you walk past and what rooms would you uh, – would capture you? Well, I think uh, the Dutch masters never, never really appealed to me. It's all that brown and gold and white. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, – the Impressionists and the historical paintings, you know, sort of Jacques Louis David and Messonnier, were these like battle scenes and things like that. And young kid loves that stuff. He's not a household name now, but he was back then. He, it's sort of like the guys today who are doing Civil War reenactment paintings and killing it. You know, it's like, oh, that's what the Battle of Gettysburg looked like. Well, that's what he was. Uh, he's the model for all those guys. Uh, Napoleonic Wars. And, you know, you could feel, like, people freezing in the mud in his paintings. Uh, really good with uniforms and horses. <laughs> so Dali copied a lot of Missonnier, and to, that's why he drew so well. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. I'm sure people are going to say, it's not Missonnier. <laughs> you sound pretty impressive to me. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> um, so you you keep talking about drawing, and I know that um, being uh, having solid drawing skills is part of the way that you can find your way to great paintings, but you also work in a whole lot of mediums. Do you want to talk to me about the evolution of that? Like, you've gone from sketchbook to watercolor. I've seen you do oils. I know you're doing egg tempera stuff. Like... It, has it just been a constant evolution and exploration? Was there an order of operations? It's exploration is the key word there. It's just a fascination with material. Um, I, I love it. I love uh, they 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 each have a certain voice. Like oil is said, this sort of buttery material, and you can paint it thin, you can paint it thick, you can do all these different things. It, it has these. It's drying time. And egg tempera has a quicker drying time, but it has its own idiosyncrasies. Watercolor uh, is elusive to master, but sometimes it's the simplest, like the most responsive kid medium that's out there. Um, and I think that any engagement with material, whether it's like pottery and you're glazing or you're carving or something, you're engaged with the material. And that's why I think the listening aspect does uh, it does a number on my, like, anxiety levels and things like that to just be in that moment listening to what the material wants to do. Um, I got into the egg tempera because of uh, COVID. I had I had some around, some payments, I was, uh, some pigments and egg yolk was everywhere. <laughs> you know, so I said, well, how is this done right? Because I loved Andrew Wyeth's egg tempers and Thomas Hart Benton and Grant Wood. And I felt like, well, they say it's so hard. Well, I want to figure it out. I got nothing but time. I have nobody to prove this to. So it was a perfect opportunity to, uh, while the world is shut down, to just be completely like engaged in what is making this stuff do what it does and why is it so wonderful. And um, and I'm still just still scratching the surface. Yeah. But it's like it's Botticelli painted egg tempera. Uh, could go on and on with it. I definitely want to talk more about your COVID experience, but I want to sort of back up and say you sort of were like, oh, I w- I'm, I've studied art and then I did all this other stuff. Like, is there a moment where you considered yourself a professional artist? Did you consider yourself a professional artist all the while? You know, like, again, Tim's like, who are you really? Like, <laughs> are you really an artist? Like, I guess I just am trying to get a sense in my head about the timeline. Well, that's a pretty good, interesting question because 
you know, when you write down on certain applications and things like that, and you ask for your get in a box, get in a jo- box, right? Your job, you know, what's your uh, your what's your profession? And they put artists as like, oh, that's kind of pretentious, you know, because everybody's something. So I would put illustrator. That sounded more professional. <laughs> Got it. Or even and illustrators are 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 artists, you know, and uh, so. They just have a commercial application to what they're doing. And uh, I think getting involved in Plan Air, which was I think where we wanted to go. Yeah. It started when I was, uh, I, I had come to Easton and while there were some painters around. And no, it wasn't Easton, it was Annapolis. Okay. That's where I first saw some painters out there with their easels. And I thought, well. How long ago was this? Why, why I'm obsessed with the timeline today, I really don't know. But I need some benchmarks. Well, I want to say 2006 or seven. Okay. Yeah. And and I thought, well, there are all these painters out there. And I and I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get my sketchbook or do something like that. And they're like, oh, no, you just don't join this. You apply. And, well, how do you hear about this? Because I was uh, not really clued into like internet or any of that. I just was staying away from it for some reason. <clears throat> Laziness mostly. But you you could find out about all these events going on and exhibits and calls for entry and all these things. It was a whole new world. You're like, game on. <laughs> it's like, this is great. And uh, But I had to like apply for you know six months in advance. And I... I was on my way to get involved in the quick draw on, on Easton that year, and the traffic was so backed up that I totally blew it off. Failed. <laughs> I, As an event organizer, <laughs> I love to hear that. <laughs> I said, well, I was had my daughter with me say, well, there's nowhere we're, we're going to make it in time. So we uh, turned around. But the next year I was in, and um, and I, I started meeting all these painters. I had... Um, Started making friends, and they, it was just talking art material, art supplies, and uh, painters I'd never heard of before who were mostly uh, American Impressionists and, and you know California people and all that. And uh, yeah, it just was a big, wide, wonderful world. But for you me. must have been like generally aware of plein air painting as part of your like the history of plein air painting. It must have been taught to you at your fancy education, right? Like you knew what it was or like not well, even really? Well, I knew what uh, excuse me, plein air was. I didn't know that it was that a people thing. Were, were, <laughs> that people had turned it into a sport. Yeah, right. And <laughs> that it. there was cash involved. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Uh, got no, it was like, uh, I, of course I knew the Impressionists and uh, the American Impressionists, and William Merritt Chase, and, and, then, and then studying from nature... Uh, goes way way back. Sure. You know? So, and that was key to. First of all, I I would need to do renderings of architecture, and they said we want to know what it looks like, what it feels like to have people sitting out on a sidewalk on a beautiful day like today, uh, just chit chatting, and they're under umbrellas, and and here's our beautiful building in the background. And this is the space we want people to. To buy into that's you were, you were an illustrator for that type of thing, right? Okay. And so, well, how do you get to do that? You take photo references, or you sketch people in all kinds of uh, positions of talking or walking, or you know, well, you know, pushing carriages. <laughs> they, they call them carriages now, they <laughs> strollers, and uh, uh, so that was just. Second nature. I thought everybody, you know, that's what you did. It wasn't like anything special, but that was no different than setting up an easel and painting something just for the sake of the light, the shadow. It's a study, you know. It's and and the thing, it's always looked good to me to have plein air paintings look like they're studies, that they are a, a discovery, and it's a record of that discovery. After the thing is done, the happening's over, and now you have a product. But it was the experience of the plein air thing, which is the most exciting. Even even if you're just watching, it's not. It, that's also an engaged uh, experience for non-artists to be involved in that way, in a sort of visceral way. And then it becomes a an aspiration to go after a product, this museum finished thing. That kind of kills it for me, and, and because it just looks like it's has less 
discovery involved in it. There's less fiddling about. There's a, something I like the, the the hesitancy of some plein air work that's there. So I'm going to say this in a different way. What you're saying is, you know, that people when they spend too much time creating a plein air piece, it is like a studio piece outside. Yes. Is that what you're like? Is that a dummy way to say what you just said? That's a a very astute way of saying what I just said. And I know there's going to be a lot of controversy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) So I guess like where we're sort of headed is, you know, what is plein air painting? Like when does a painting no longer, when is a painting no longer a plein air work of art? In your definition, like what would be the rules around an authentic where you could you could stamp it with like this is an authentic Stuart White plein air painting? Like what would the criteria have to be? Well, you know, it's a tough one because um, there, the nature of competition now requires the, there to be a little bit of pressure to, to clean everything up that you do out there. I think that if you were to go back to the same spot, and we know painters that do this, and they – they are trying to get better every day, just like I guess Monet did with the, the Cathedral sure. of Rouen, to say here's how the light is there. And you know he didn't knock those things out in a few hours. He just went back at the same time. And lights are changing. No day is ever the same, you know. But it was still getting effect of of a uh, evening light or morning light or high noon. You can feel the heat on the building, and. And that's perfectly legit plein air painting. That's that's scientific study that way. I think that uh, I think the sort of well, I don't know. I shouldn't talk about what I don't like, but to answer your question more uh, precisely, I think that there's a certain honesty about experiencing the light of the moment. You can't freeze it, but you can say this is a good composition. This is good design. What is that moment? And shadows are changing all the time. That's why it's not a photograph because you've got different times of day reflected in the same painting. And um, to me, that gives it its sort of uniqueness. Plus, you kind of uh, infuse it with uh, your whole history of aesthetic sensibility and But that's a different that's, that's like a whole different question because it's like, you know, is it still a plein air painting if you decide that the red car should actually be blue because it's better composition or as you, you know, remove or add trees or, you know, like to, to what extent can your brain and that experience edit what you're looking at and you still think that it's a plein air painting? Like how much creativity versus um, that scientific study can there be with, and still call it plein air? Well, I, use, I think I used to get trapped up in the sort of photojournalist approach to painting a scene. Well, if that lamp post is there, well, that's what – I've That's got a paint. Truth. Yeah, right. and uh, to take it out would be uh, dishonest. I don't know where I got that ridiculous notion because it uh, it's not about those things. It's not about um, any record of of a building, for example, which I love to paint architecture. But it's uh, I don't I don't have to put in all the windows that are there. I mean, unless the owner of the building is. Very right, you're commissioning it. That's something different. <laughs> yeah, like a, but we're talking about plein air, right, But we're talking about plein air competitions, which, yeah. which you know very well. Again, just to give backdrop, you know, Stuart Marie Counted has been in plein air East in 13 times. He's a grand prize winner. Like you know yeah. what these competitions are, but, and uh, the competitions are not about us commissioning a painting of exactly this many windows or whatever. Some of the conversations that we have are about these notions of. Uh, you know, deleting and editing and and composing and taking uh, taking these things and and taking the physical world and painting your sensations with it. You know, what you select as a subject matter is like step one. Where you're going around, and you're driving around, and uh, I, I'm looking for a painting to paint. And you you really don't have to go very far. All, all you do is 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 find something that you know you catches your eye and I've wasted a ton of time just looking for where's the painting you know that I'm looking for and I like to take this thing like uh, 
you know, where what's an interesting problem that I could solve visually or that I don't know too much about? For example, uh, I don't know, rocks underneath the water. You know, they how do you get that effect? I'm not good at that, but other painters that have been involved in these things are really excellent at it. So I, I learned from them. And uh, you know. Tim, do you believe that Stuart answered the question about what legitimately is a plein air painting and what is not? I've been like, lost I heard the him last say, five minutes. <laughs> I, I heard him say some really, really smart well, things, and I feel like he kind of skirted around. So. Well, I guess my <laughs> my question would be: is is do do all are all if you say impressionists or does do do all all types of painting? Can they sort of like finagle with the rules uh, uh, in terms of what is what, or is that just to plein air because of its history? Yeah, I mean, what are we what are we really trying to get at here? I mean, I don't think it's a plein air painting to you know, paint the inside of your bedroom, you know. Uh, even if it's from life, even if you're staring at your bedroom, the yeah. fact that it's inside, interiors to you, and again, this is not plein air Easton, this is just like us having interesting conversation. <laughs> interiors to you don't count as plein air because you can control the light too much. Is that the issue? Well, it, it just... Uh, <laughs> I can, I can hear, wait, I can. wait, wait, wait a second. Stuart was like, nothing's off limits. Well, I'll talk about anything. And now we're like, listen, him and he's like squirming. So Stuart, we can back off, Stuart. We can totally oh, no, 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 I wasn't going to back off. I'm just gonna <laughs> off I know you don't want dead air, so I had to think. <laughs> you, you just came through a pandemic. <laughs> don't hold back, man. Just Stuart is looking around for the emergency exit. Say, it's like he got a little bit terrified for a second. Well, well first of all, Jesse, I, your first question I guess I'm, what I'm saying is that it's no, there's no real hard answer to that about what's plein air and what's not. It comes down to like everybody's uh, personal idea of what that is. And it would be hard to codify it into like it's this, it's 80% outdoor, 20% right. this, 15% touching up when you hang it in the wall. You know, And uh, I mean all those things are just individual things. I, I've – I have – Looked at a painting I did during that day, and the next day I felt like, you know, the paint dried a little lighter than I would have liked. It would be a lot sharper looking if I just beefed it up, you know, intensified the color here and there. And uh, and I'm okay with it. You know, I, did, I, uh, I think the thing about what I, I initially responded to something – well, I'll take for an example. It's in, in – in Annapolis, I was driving around. Uh, to one of the organizers, like yourselves, would say, "Hey, go to Murray Hill. There's a lot of people there. Don't and never see a painter there, you know." So they okay, send people out. over there, and you'll do that. Send somebody over to that farm. Somebody they learn away. There's no artists here, and so I said, "Well, I'll go. Sure." Yeah, and and I'm uh, driving around, and then there's uh, some house painters, ladders all over this Victorian house, and. Uh, and I think, well, I like those kind of things. I like contractors. And so I set up and started painting and sketching this stuff and everything else. And then the ladders would move around. I would just put another guy there. So there's like three times more ladders on the house than, <laughs> than there was. And, and the same guy, I'd just give him a different T-shirt color. Or, you know, He'd have like a sweatshirt over his head. And there were little just things going on. And, and I was loving – the process of the painting and what's going on in front of me was all theater. But at the end of the day, you're, you're, you can be overwhelmed by the subject you're painting. You're comparing it to what you just did and you're like, oh, this is just not even close to how magnificent you know, nature is. So it's best to just take it out, take it away. You're not going to compete with nature. You, you never are. And so now you're, you're looking at your painting away from the subject and you can just evaluate it for its own merits. Is this good? Is that? Is that too busy? Is this and that? And then start applying your knowledge onto that painting, and then then submit it for so, to judgment. Win, submit it to win the grand <laughs> prize is what he just said. So I think that's a perfect time to shift gears and get you out of the hot seat. Post pandemic, you ha- have reemerged, and the, like while. We certainly appreciate your participation in Plenary Easton last year. It was not a competition. It was more like a series of paint outs. Um, and then was Annapolis your first big sort of 
first full scale event post pandemic? Uh, no, I was in Florida. For, got it. Forgotten got it. Coast. So you've been warming up. You've been warming up for your grand prize win. <laughs> yeah, it was a slow, steady build up. Uh, I, I won a, an architectural award in Olmsted, awesome. in Atlanta. And that was Thank in person you. too. You went down there in person. No, I did not. That uh, you did participate in their virtual piece. In their virtual. So you wouldn't call that post pandemic. That is sort of hybrid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what we call a pandemic <laughs> hybrid. Yeah. For those of us who have been virtual learning with our children, we understand what this right, means. Yeah. Yeah. It's different than concurrent learning and some of the other words I could throw around. Or, or, or just coming out of the dark ages. How, the how the tough dawning. was that pandemic for you? Like you, you were saying that you explored egg tempera and you were able to sort of perfect things. Like, was it tough? Was it easy? Was it, was it, tell us a little bit about the pandemic experience for you. Uh, I, I didn't really have a hard time. I, I enjoy my, uh, my company immensely. Uh, I cracked myself up. Perfect. <laughs> That's good. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I would do, uh, you know, I got caught up on a lot of uh, series, TV series and things like that, like other, other people did. I read. I, I learned a lot of history. Um, it was just like if prison is like this, I could do it. I could do prison. But prison's not like that. No, no, <laughs> yes, I, so. I don't have personal experience. Well, it's but, funny because I actually started reading back because I was looking for like what artists did in the last pandemic because we're an arts organization and that's just something I looked up. Huh. Yeah. And um, really, there was not much that came out of it. There was a guy named Munch. Um, not Munch, not much. Um, who yeah, Edward, 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 Edward Monk. Yeah, yeah. Monk. Monk, uh, who sort of gained popularity because... I think it's, it's the way he did his faces. There was sort of like there was a grotesqueness to him that sort of represented kind of what people were going through in the last pandemic. But well, the not much is happened. What he's most known for. Yeah. Not much happened for you guys for you during the pan. Not the creativity. Uh, did you did feel that- like it was stymied, or did you feel it like was creativity stagnant? Did it increase well, or on, did it decrease? Oh, on the contrary, uh, I thought it was uh, uh, very stimulating. Awesome. Um, that's yeah, how he, he was able to come out and um, win at Olmst- win an award at Olmsted and win the grand prize at Annapolis. Is like you were powered up the whole time. Your brain was <laughs> buzzing with creativity the whole time. Well, I was I was anxious to get uh, these uh, plein air events going. I mean, I really missed them. You know what and, he's really saying to all of the other people competing <laughs> this year is, "Watch out, he's coming for you." Come on, yeah, come on, Stuart, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but, you know, we, we talked about how uh, it, it would be good for the planet, uh, just all of us to take a break. You know, it was an interesting idea because the planet was really like bouncing back during the pandemic. And like wildlife around here in Easton was was everywhere. Things I've never seen before. It was quiet. And there was a lot, a lot to like about it. Um, it creatively speaking, I did a little like Tuesday Facebook live show and that would gear me up to have that deadline to do that on Tuesday to like uh, come up with a topic, research it, study it and in the you know most awkward way I can imagine try to do it live without um, you know all the, the great studio apparatus to do a really proper show. Uh, but you, Charlie Hunter was doing something like yep. that reading stories uh, Matt Barbara Kennedy was doing. Uh, little stories, narrative things. And, you know, a lot of people are doing different things, and which was like uh, keep keeping your hand in, you know. And I, I wanted to study about uh, color, the color wheel, so I did a thing on that and uh, different artists. And, has it been Has it been great to be back in the competition circuit to see the competitions come back on? Has it been awkward or strange? It, has it been, you know? What's the experience of re- reentry? <clears throat> Well, most recently, I would say it, it's sort of looking forward to um, getting together with uh, old friends. Your friends. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's like any, uh, you know, the Daffodil Society, if they were, <laughs> if they were to get together and uh, you know, compare their, what, what they've been doing uh, during the pandemic. I don't know what that is, but I would like to join. It well, that's really it. it's, just people, it's just people that raise uh, award-winning daffodils. It's like best of show for dogs. You know, oh, no. so they, everybody has a competition, and we're part of that. So that just group eager of, to be back with the camaraderie. Yeah, and I like I like that uh, there are really good painters out there that that you want to. Um, 
you know, if not compete, you kind of you just you want to impress them. You you want the uh, you want the I don't yeah just just there's a word I'm missing, but just you know the the approval of your peers. I think that's uh, what I'm trying to say. That's a sense of community. You don't you don't have to yeah. go it alone anymore. You're back with your buds. Yeah, because we, I mean we were doing this at, at hanging day at. Uh, in Annapolis, is you'd say, well, what do you think about this? Who do this? Who do that? Or you, should I hang this one there? And I, I think no one's saying, well, don't hang that one because that's the best one. <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna edge me out of the competition. But I think everybody is like, saying, yeah, this is a better piece. This is that. I think they do it in in all honesty to have everybody show their best work. When you ask somebody that, you ask an artist versus say like myself, who's not a painter. Um, we you always listen. Would you always listen to the painter first, or does sometimes the novice say, "No, I think you should put that one on top because it'll show better," or don't use that one because I don't really like that painting? Because uh, people ask me all the time. I mean, especially you, friends, you, people you get to know through this through the plenary Easton Festival. What do you think is the better painting? And and sometimes I have an opinion on it. I could like, well, I think the. That's going to sell. I, I can, I can. Right. I think this is, this is something that we've talked about before. Are you painting to? Are you painting to win? Or are you painting to sell? Because sometimes it's not the same thing. Sometimes it know. is very much the same thing. Yeah, it, it, it is the same thing because um, it, depending on who's judging, depending on uh, what's going on, you may think the prize money is worth going after, or another thing. People say, I, "I'm." I'm not going to get involved in the pricing. I just want to make some good sales. And so people have their own agendas when they right. do these events. And 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 in a lot of cases, uh, if they are intending to sell, they they get their objectives. You know, because they are that's a smart strategy. The competition thing is a little risky, but um, I think in a lot of ways your audience is a little bit different in that way about what's the best painting. It comes down to a whole like slew of of considerations of originality uh execution things like that that may not be something to we use, use the word the novice but i do want to like, address that that comments from a novice can be just as you know uh insightful as any other you know i think i mean because people everybody looks at paintings and you know unless they're you know that pink would go great with my sofa, you know, kind of comment. But it, it's uh, you know other things of, about no, that really that has a that has something. You know, it caught my eye. Whereas other painters might be you know so critical they're missing some of the like the stuff that's right in front of your face. So we don't want to take too much more of your time, although we could talk to you all day. And thankfully, you live in this fabulous town of Easton now, so we could actually talk to you all day, every day. (laughs) Um, But we certainly have a lot of new artists who are coming to participate in Plenary Easton for the first time this year, or like maybe this is their first competition ever, and they have found themselves here in the heat ready to compete. What are some words of advice to people who have never been to Easton or maybe don't have a lot of experience in plenary competitions? What are some like rules of the road or um, advice that you might offer to them? Yeah, I would say petition to have the event a little bit earlier in the year. <laughs> but, no, Wait, it is that's a, your advice is that they should start harassing us <laughs> right out of the gate to change the date after 17 years? That's the worst <laughs> advice I can imagine. Well, I'm guessing this could all be deleted. You know, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. It's going live. No, but, uh, but I would say um, <clears throat> to, again, I mean, don't go wandering all over Delmarva Peninsula looking for stuff to paint. You know, if you can, you you want to. Or, but I would say get get your uh, feet on the ground with something you're comfortable. Right, just off the first couple of days, um, there'll be events, places where you can go that you, everywhere you look, you can't miss. There's something great to paint. Do you already know in your head what you think your two competition pieces are going to be, like what the subject matter is going to be? Have you been sort of – because I know that there's there's different – because like you said, there's different approaches. There are some people who paint until they feel like they paint a bunch of stuff and then they say, dang, I really nailed that. I think that one is my competition piece. And then yeah. I know that there are people uh, – I'd put David Shant in this 
position. He is really thinking about his frames and his size watercolor and like what mm-hmm. he wants to paint for his competition pieces. He He's thinking about it years in advance if he can. I think that he has yeah. in his mind what mm-hmm. he's going to paint. I know Tim Kelly is one who's always like dangling. He was like boasting on Facebook a week ago that he has a very ambitious idea for Plenary Easton this year. Oh, no. Uh, can watch out. <laughs> watch out. <laughs> um, but so do you know what your competition base or do you think – He's not going to say. Yeah, I, I have no. I never think of it that way. Um, the best painting you're going to do is the next one you're going to do. So how could you uh, decide? Oh, I'm going to do this one because uh, I can't sleep at night thinking about it. Um, it. It may not turn out. That's how I approach it. <clears throat> I will probably do uh, Tim and Susie's garden. Finally. Look <laughs> at him just buttering up to his new neighbor. You, you, you yeah. hear that? Yeah. I've been trying to get that garden painted for 10 years. <laughs> Finally, it's going to happen. Well, there's a lot, but there's things that I'm living here. I, I see them a lot differently than when I was just visiting and coming for the event. And um, yeah, I have a couple of things. Uh, there's a. Uh, In mind. There's a wood. Cutting operation off we were, Route 50. We, we, we're not trying to tell you. You don't need to tell people. Like, you don't have to relieve, like, put your secrets out there. I was just saying generally how, how much <laughs> yeah. of a planner are you? Yeah, I feel like I just showed my hand. Oh, no. <laughs> we're going to put it on the private properties list and really mess with you. <laughs> no, just kidding. Delete, delete, delete. <laughs> um, Stuart, it's been, it's, been great. it's been great talking to you. Congratulations on your big big win in Annapolis. Um, it's been fun to get to know you over the last 13 years. We're certainly glad you're in Easton. Why did you choose to move here? Uh, I, I like the scale of this town, mm-hmm. and I did have friends here, yourself and Tim included. <laughs> and uh, I, I feel like, well, where, where else could I go? I think it's centrally located um, north, east, south. Well, not so far east, but um, I, uh, yeah, I just, I think I wanted to see last year when I came here, I rented a place during the pandemic and said, what is this place like year round? It wasn't an indication of what it's really like because it was in shutdown. <laughs> but it, it, I, well, you got a taste of it though. Yeah, I did. Got- and there's, um, you know, I mean, just how Avalon was trying to get uh, concerts going again and the kind of things that you guys were trying to do to uh, get around you know, the, the restrictions, uh, you know, it's just, it's just kind of like that fighting spirit. We're going to figure out something. And I feel like, uh, I, you know, I like live music. So that's here. Now, there's just so much to like about this part of the world. So, awesome. Well, I would say yeah. we look forward to seeing you for Plein Air Easton in just a couple of weeks in July, but we'll probably see you before then. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Stuart, thanks for stopping by uh, and imparting your uh, thoughts on plein air painting in general. And we do look forward to hosting you and, and you know, all the other plein air painters heading to town. It's, it's just become a really popular thing in communities ac- across the country. They, and I don't even say with the Olmstead or the Door County or the, you know, there's, I think there's one in Sheboygan. You know, I, there's there's one in Podunk. You know, they're, they're all over the place now. And um, thanks to guys like you and 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 uh, and, and you know, uh, planner painters from all over that have, have sort of made it popular. So, well, to add to the braggadocia, which is a brand new word I just <laughs> learned from you, Tim. Holy cow, braggadocia. braggadocia! To add to our own braggadocia, is that not the word you said? You almost got it right. Can you say it so I can learn it better? Braggadocia. Braggadocia. <laughs> to add to our own well, braggadocia. Well, you can be um, super braggadocia. <laughs> super cow. <laughs> um, um, in any case, what I just wanted to do was quote Marie from our last episode. Plenar Easton is better than back. So she's working really hard to put all of the new events back online. And so definitely check in and see what's new at plenareeston.com. And thank you so much, Stuart White, for coming into well, thank you. our office space and talking to us mask-free and better than back. This is the Plenary Easton Podcast. It was a pleasure. The Plenary Easton Podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions with additional episode music by Poddington Bear. 
Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plan Air Easton at planairisten.com.